Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for coming. I'm going to do a very brief introduction to explain why Dr. Adam Shiner is actually here in San Miguel de Allende at this moment. Um, he is married to my niece, and so, <laughs> and our family, my sister-in-law and my niece and her husband and the two children are visiting. And we were visiting all of them last January, my husband, Allie and I, and Allie spent the day with Adam at his practice. And he was just um, so impressed, my husband, with um, Adam's practice and also his enthusiasm for what he does. And so he said to him, you know, when you come to visit in San Miguel, why don't you do a presentation? You know, people would love it. And so that's why we're here. And the only thing that I want to say also is that I know that Adam's patients have said to him, you have changed my life. And so I'm going to ask Adam to tell us exactly what it is he does and how he has changed people's lives. Dr. Adam Shine. <laughs> Thank you, Yomi, and uh, yeah, I think we're having a great time tonight. I give talks all over the world, and so I'm very excited to have you as you as my audience here today. We're going to cover a bunch of different topics today, and hopefully the fans will keep us a little bit cool back there. And, and it's nice that I gave some portable fans also to use. This is good. So, yeah, I always think it's kind of interesting to know the background of the person who's coming to speak to you. So, I actually come from the Northeast. Um, I went to college actually at Rutgers. I, I did my medical school training at the University of Pennsylvania, I did a residency. I did a fellowship in uh, facial plastics out in Oklahoma City. I've been private practice for the past 16 years or so. Interestingly, I have kind of an international practice. I'll talk about why, but I have people, and I help people from all over the world that come to see me with the things that, that I do. And I, and I love the fact that I'm able to be a resource for people. So the, the seminar I'm going to talk about today, the first part we're going to talk about is our faces and nonverbal communication. Um, we'll talk about the idea of the survival of the prettiest, the golden ratio, the impacts of our eyes, nose, and brows, uh, our central face, your appearance and social interactions, and, and something called the 3Ds of aging. Um, then, as I, I will talk a lot about, you know, be educated now about sun exposure and what it means to us, and actually ways that we can reverse sun exposure too, which is a really important topic because you know, we, I live in Florida, I'm, I have young kids, I'm always trying to keep them protected from the sun, and it's something we all need to know about. So we'll talk about understanding your skin, curation of the skin, reversing, reversing facial sun damage, which are ways that I, things that I can do. We'll talk about um, more of these three days of day, aging, descent of the eyebrows, ways we can fix that, and eyelids, defacing of the face, um, and then we'll, we'll have our conclusion. So there was actually a, a paper that came out by a colleague of mine, his name is Jen Shed Khan, back in 2001. It was called Aesthetic Surgery, Diagnosing and Healing the Miscues of Human Facial Expression. And really what he propositions, which I think is true, is that we have all these muscles in our face, right? And we have that for a reason, because our face is really an organ for communication. Um, the interpretation of these messages is really innate. And sometimes with birth, sometimes with age, our faces can change in ways and can send messages out there which are not congruent with the way that we feel inside. And I do feel this way. I don't necessarily have a lot of narcissistic patients sitting there with a mirror, thinking about how great they look in the mirror. It's really more about uh, their faces changing ways, and it's not congruent with the way that they feel. There's a um, there's a book by a woman, next, Nancy Eckhoff. She's actually at Harvard. She's a PhD. She wrote this book called Survival of the Prettiest, The Science of Beauty. And she actually looked at a scientific societal view of beauty. And really, this idea of beauty has been known throughout the ages. When Aristotle was asked why people desire physical beauty, he responded, no one who is not blind could ask that question. And according to Dr. Eckhoff, from a practical basis, we routinely evaluate each other all the time. And they've done studies. And in a nursery, the more attractive babies actually get a little more attention from the nurses than the less attractive babies. And then I think this is interesting. I, I think this is true. We do tend to want to please people that we find attractive with no expectation of a need reward or reciprocal gestures. So when we're talking about this idea of beauty, is this all the, what they say, the eye of the whole? This is all subjective. And I think that, that does play a role in how we view each other. But I think there's something else here, too, that I want to try and prove to, to you today. And this idea of, of mathematics and mathematics and beauty. So I'm going to take you back to the uh, 1200s uh, in Italy, in Pisa, Italy. Um, Italy was actually more city-states back then. 
and there was a person there named Leonardo Fibonacci, and he came from an upper class family, and he actually went over to India and to Asia and learned mathematical concepts and actually brought it back to what then was these, this, what we know as modern Italy. And interestingly, he's partly responsible for why we have an alphabetic system around the world now, because a lot of uh, Italian culture, Roman culture, went throughout the entire globe. And so, if not for him, he was partly responsible for this, um, for us using not Roman numerals, but this uh, idea of the alphabetic system. So he wrote a book here called Liberabaci. And in this, um, it's a big text, in this was a sequence that he came up with uh, that he called the Fibonacci sequence. And the sequence went as follows. Take the first number in the sequence, add it to the next number sequence, and that gets you the next number. So 1 plus 1 equals 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, and so on. When you divide these numbers by each other, it comes up with a ratio of 1 to 1.618. And when they started to look at nature, they found that a lot of things in nature have this ratio. When you look at the internal parts of a flower to the external parts of the flower, it had this ratio of 1 to 1.618. They thought this was a divinely inspired ratio uh, because they saw this so much in nature. With numerical sequences, you could find curves, and they did, and they found that the curve of this uh, golden ratio of Fibonacci actually matched the curve of the Nautilus, which matched the curve of the helix of the year. And they used this a lot. They used this in architecture when they were putting together the Parthenon and Notre Dame or painting. One was this space actually has a lot of these ratios. They were using the painters at the time, and at this time we have artistic group, they were using these ratios all the time back then in ter terms of that facial balance. So they, it makes sense actually, you can define faces according to these ratios, and they have. And they actually looked at, irregardless of ethnic background, the more someone has these certain ratios uh, congruent with these golden ratios, the more attractive and apparently that face is seen. So I think that I think math is part of this, and I will say uh, to go back there. Actually, when we went to Pisa, go back here for a second. It's kind of cool. So this is actually this is actually me with the statue of Leonardo da Vinci. I was really excited because we went there for a trip. I gave a talk at the University of Siena there when we were there, and we were touring around. And then we went to Pisa, and my wife was really excited about climbing the Tower of Pisa, which I I enjoyed too. But uh, this was what I was really excited about because he came from that town, so I got to pose with, with the uh, statue. Of Leonardo. Okay. Anyway. So I do think that there is a subjective basis to this too. And I think what happens is the media has this roving eye and it's constantly presented to us and it influences us what it thinks as really the eye content today. And I think by studying eye content, we do get an idea of, of what they are showing us and what does influence us also in terms of what we think about beauty. So you know, we have Julia Roberts here. She has a lot of characteristics we see in female beauty. She, she has a long, a uh, long smooth forehead to a shorter nose. Her nose is smaller, so her eyes seem farther apart. She has a gold wing shape to her brow, a nice shape to her, her jawline. If we compare this with Brad Pitt, we see differences here. We don't see a, an arch brow, right? We see a straight ahead brow. His nose is bigger, so his eyes seem closer together. He has larger muscles for chewing, and his masticatory muscles gives him more of a square jaw. Look at uh, Brad Pitt and Angela Jolie. You see the horizontal brow here. We see the arched brow here. We see the, the eyes seem closer together here, farther apart here. We see a more chiseled jaw and more shaped jaw here. And this is, I'm going to try and prove this to you, the idea that our subconscious is constantly evaluating each other. So this is actually part of a study. So if you look at these two pictures, I'm going to ask you, which photo do you see as more of the female? Which one? Which one's more, which is the male photo of these on the left or the right? You see that? Okay. Do, you, do you know why you're saying that? But you feel it, right? It looks like a man, right? Because this is actually a picture of the same person. And what they did is they artificially darkened the eye region and the mouth region in this photo and left it um, natural in this photo. So it turns out interesting. This is part of things that our subconscious constantly do. We're constantly valuing each other. We can pick up cues about male or female based on contrast. Men, like myself, we have less contrast in our faces. Women intrinsically have to have more contrast. And women know this. I mean, women will wear eyeshadow lipstick because it, it makes the, the face more feminine. If we look at uh, Jessica Biel here, you know, without makeup, with makeup, it's definitely a more feminine appearance here. And here we have Elizabeth Taylor. I really do, I, I think, I mean, she was really beautiful and her eyes were, were really extraordinary back in the day. And this is part of what I'm going to talk about is we do look at these areas, the eyes and the mouth a lot. So um, I went to a, a talk one time uh, where I heard uh, the physician Daniel Alam, he was actually a facial plastic surgeon from Queen Clinic, Clinic, and he did one of the first face transplants. Um, I found it kind of interesting because as he was talking, it really was congruent with a lot of things that I felt too. So 
he did um, a, the first space transplant of a woman named Connie Cole. Um, I'm actually in, I'm in Tampa, Florida, uh, and I'm involved with the domestic violence shelter in my town called the Spring of Tampa Bay. I'm very passionate about that cause. Anyway, she was a victim of domestic violence, and her estranged husband actually shot her in the face with a shotgun. Uh, she survived, and uh, this was Connie. And unfortunately, very sweet woman, but, and here's the thing, if you knew Connie, you would continue to have a friendship with her, but if she's trying to go out to form new relationships, you can understand that would get in the way of building new relationships. And the reason that we were talking about this is because he said that, you know, when we have transplants, transplants don't last forever. They last a certain amount of time. And the anti-reduction drugs that they put people on to help the transplants survive will actually shorten a person's life. Uh, there's more uh, chance that someone can have certain cancers, blood cancer things, when they're on these anti-rejection medications. So the question is, if she's living otherwise, why would she go through this? And I think it's because we are inherently social beings and we love connecting with each other. This is what life is about. So she, this is Connie after her face transplant. And I think, yeah, it's a little, little different here, but she, that's a much better way that she can form facial, uh, social relationships. So in this talk, he was talking about the importance of the face. And this is what I've talked about forever, which is the idea of the eyes and the mouth being the two critical parts of the face. So he said, if we take our president you know, in the US, Barack Obama, and we, we take this part out of him, right, the eyes and the mouth, okay, and we put it on another, another person, right? Does that, do you still see Barack Obama there to a certain degree? Yeah. And do you know who that is? So there's a, there's a, an actress named Jamie Lee Curtis, she has this quote, she said, the first thing I look at in a woman uh, is her soul, and then I check her eyebrows. <laughs> and this is a patient of mine. And she came to me, she said, you know, Dr. Shiner, people always think I'm stern, and I'm not stern, and they think I'm very serious, and I don't feel that way, so what's going on? And I looked at her and I said, you know, I think I, think I have an idea of what's happening here. So I did one thing for her, and I, I mean, if you look at this too, this is someone who seems more approachable, I guess, than this person, right? Even though they're not talking to us. And that's part of what I'm saying. There's this hidden language that goes on between us all the time that we are reacting to constantly. So I think, I'm going to show you, so the reason I think you'd like this picture better, remember this curve that I was showing you of Fibonacci? So if we take this part of the curve, I don't want to there, and put it there. You see how it matches that curve? So I think reestablishing these ratios actually makes the more, the face more in balance and more harmonious and therefore more beautiful. So this was uh, Rob Lowe back in, I think, the 80s and, and uh, Brad Pitt today. And which, which one of these has the more typical male brow? Brad Pitt, right? So and I, I think what he was doing, I mean, he was being dramatic, but he actually plucked his brows in that shape. But that was definitely a more female appearance that he was creating his brows back then. Okay, so... Our appearance is social interaction business. We are very social beings, and we constantly evaluate each other for communication cues. And our faces are a big factor in nonverbal communication with others. When we speak, this, is, this has been estimated that what you're hearing from me is 7% of, of it is my words, 38% um, is my verbal tone, and 55% uh, is the nonverbal communication, the facial cues, the body cues, facial expressions. When we see each other, okay, our, what our brain does, we look at each other's eyes and mouth first, and then we kind of appreciate the skin and the facial contours. And our subconscious brain then tells our conscious brain about how do we feel about what we saw in those areas. It influences us. Aging changes that occur around the eyes, mouth, and skin can convey an impression of being sick, tired, or less vibrant. This is actually a patient of mine. She's actually an actress at Disney in, uh, in Florida. And she was having some challenges with the way her face was changing and maintaining in the acting, acting world. Uh, we'll get back to her in a bit. Um, I would say she does, I mean, here she does, this, she does look kind of sick or tired of that. Do you agree? Even though she's not saying anything to us. So improvements made to the eye region, skin and mouth, can have positive effects on the way that people perceive us. Simple changes, makeup to the skin, to the eyes, lips, wearing, flattering glasses for guys, wearing facial hair around the mouth. This all takes advantage of these two very powerful areas of the face for nonverbal communication. I will say though, sometimes with age, sometimes makeup and glasses are not enough, and that's when people will come to see me with my expertise. I'll show you a little uh, case study here. This, um, this is a patient of mine. She's actually a, a PhD in toxicology. She taught in university. Um, 
interestingly, she was getting comments from her students at the time saying, you know, you know, you taught, you know, the professor, are you tired? Do you need to rest? You know, you look like you look like you didn't get enough rest last night. And she felt fine. And that's that's frustrating if you hear that a lot from someone. You know, they're trying to be caring, but if you hear that more over and over, it starts to affect you. I mean, she also was she was divorced, and she was out trying to to uh, find a partner again. And this and this appearance that that tired appearance wasn't really helping her. Um, this is actually what I was talking before about. I have a student national practice. This is something called eyelid festoons. They form on the cheekbone. It's kind of a difficult problem for uh, people to treat. I have some techniques that's been effective for this, and I've been um, sort of both featured. So for this patient, Erin, I mean, I was actually on the show called The Doctors with her. And I was showing on this show, you know, ways that I use um, lasers actually to tighten the skin to make the skin better. We talk about this, and we'll talk about how I use lasers to help with sun damage also. So new research, as well as high-profile lawsuits uh, alleging appearance-based discrimination, is raising awareness of how looks hurt or help careers. And you know, I'm in the U.S. It's interesting, but the the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. I don't know that this is what they're doing with uh, tax dollars, but they found they were doing a study between the link between appearances and wages, and they looked at people with an average appearance, and they found that the person who had below average appearance they earned about nine percent less, and people who had an above average appearance earned about five percent more, or fourteen percent swing in in these two extremes. And I think something we know or feel intrinsically, we think, yeah, this does happen. But there's some real evidence to this, and this all happens on this subconscious level of the way that we're, we're um, uh, affected by these things. I wrote a, a book that's available on Amazon called The uh, True Definition of Beauty. I really collate a lot of things I'm talking to you about here today about the way the human brain crosses the face. Well, actually, the, the New York Post had me in their paper because the, uh, the mayor's race was on, and they asked me to evaluate the candidates for mayor according to their faces and the nonverbal cues they were giving out to the electorate. And so they said, well then, what it is, I had a photo editor actually change the photo according to what I would suggest for them to, to have to allow them to communicate better with the electorate. And so, interesting, I didn't know who reads New York Post, but I guess a lot of people do. And so, uh, actually Howard Stern uh, saw it, he called me, and so I went on Howard Stern's show, and I, I got it with Howard and, uh, and Robin and all the people on his show for the same thing. So the three Ds of aging, and this is, when I look at faces, I kind of evaluate it these ways. The first thing I'll talk about is deterioration of the skin. Uh, the second is deflation of the face, and the second is descent of eyelids in the face. So introducing our skin. So we think about our body, a lot of organ systems. We think about the liver, the, the lungs, the, the uh, intestines. The skin, we don't think about it this way, it's really our largest organ. Its job is really protection. It protects us from uh, infection, uh, maintains our body temperature, protects us from chemicals, it keeps a, a food better, our body foods in, keeps other foods out. It's our biggest uh, organ for sensory input, and in the sunshine it actually has a role in making vitamin D. Um, and I don't want to get too technical here, but this is a slide I do want you to pay attention to for a minute before we'll go over this, but there's two main parts of the skin. There's this top layer called the epidermis. This is mainly dead skin cells, actually. And there's a living layer down here called the basal cell layer of the epidermis. So this cell layer is healthy, well, it makes a healthy copy above it. And so the whole epidermis can be healthy if those basal cell layers are healthy. If the cell is unhealthy, then we have irregularities in the surface of the skin. Below this is the dermis. This is where we have uh, collagen, elastic fibers, some human cells as well. And that's where we get sort of the structure to our skin. So, you know, this is the question, you know, why does our skin age? And I think there are two main things. There's the passage of time, and the big thing I have to talk about here is sun exposure. So, intrinsic aging, you can look at your relatives and see how they age if they've not been in the sun a lot. Um, but most of us have, and for terms of premature aging, photo aging is the biggest thing that we have. I'm going to prove this to you in a little bit. Um, other things, smoking, stress, topical products, pregnancy, hormone changes have effects also, but photo aging is really the biggest part of this. So, sun protection. Sun protection is the single best way to help prevent skin aging. 90% of everything that you know in terms of wrinkles, age spots, uh, sun discolor skin discoloration is due to sun attaining that exposure. And, and one more technical slide. So this is, I'm, put this, I'm calling this the ABCs of UV. When, when the sun comes down on the earth, there's visible light that allows us to see each other. And then there are invisible rays that we feel more than see, and that causes the warmth on our cheek. Those are the ultraviolet rays. And there are some rays that we should talk about here. UVA is the first one. This is a really long wavelength. It actually accelerates skin aging, so we call it uh, UVA for skin aging. It's a, 
it will be present all day long from sun up to sundown. So, you know, when the sun's just peeking out in the morning, you can get UVA exposure in that time period. Um, late in the day before the sun's going down, you can get UVA exposure there. But yes, it's strongest when it's highest in the sky, but you can get it all day long. Um, it can actually penetrate clouds and car windows. UV, so here's UVA, it goes through the epidermis, into the dermis, where it fractures collagen elastic fibers allowing the skin to sag and droop. UVB um, is, is one that creates sunburn, it makes our skin red. It's most prevalent from about 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. or 4 p.m. It penetrates through the epidermis a little bit, not as much into the dermis that you see as toxic light, and thankfully most of it's absorbed by the ozone. Sun protection factor in the states is regulated by the FDA, and SPF really only refers to protection from UVB rays. We were talking, I was talking with Naomi before about this, about how we actually saw skin cancers increase through the, the 70s and 80s. The people were using sunscreens, but because it wasn't blocking, it was SPF only, it wasn't blocking UVA, people weren't getting red, but they were getting a lot of radiation that led to some of these skin cancers. So recently the US has started to change, and we now have a measurement for UVA protection. And what we look for in the states is broad spectrum and water resistant, and broad spectrum is so critical. And because we do need to protect against UVA and UVB, because you could get, you don't have to get red at all, and you get a full dose of UVA rays, which will damage your skin. And this is the other thing I want to talk about. Incidental exposure actually matters. Every moment that your skin is exposed to the sun, it's radiation is creating skin damage. And this happens when you walk from your home to your mailbox, or when you drive your car. And I think it's critical, I mean, I have young kids, and I, I drive into them, that they put on sunscreen before they walk out the door every day. And it's critical to wear sun protection every day in all exposed skin areas. So, you know, for me now, it would be my hands and my face, and, 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 and this is what's really important. Okay, so effects of UV damage over time. So this is a this is a woman, and I mean, what she she looks like she's been battered, you know, in terms of her skin. How old does she appear to you? If you were to take a guess, I think a hundred, right? I mean, she looks, she looks older, right? She's actually fifty-eight. So she was a she was a migrant worker. I mean, she was working in the fields a lot in her life. And this gentleman, um, he's bald, so it gives us away. But I mean, how old does he look to you? Yes, same. 73. 73. 70, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he's 78. And his skin does look good, though, because he was indoors meditating, right, out of the sun. <laughs> this is um, this slide presentation here. There's a woman, she worked in an office environment, and she went through the ranks of her company, and she got a nice corner office, and the sun would come in and warm her cheek every day. And so, can you imagine, um, you know, which side of her face was facing that window? You can see it here, right? Do you remember which one of those sun rays can penetrate uh, windows? UVA, right? yeah, it's UVA damage over time. In uh, the General American Medical Association, about a year or two, they actually showed this photo. This was a truck driver, um, I think in Australia, and uh, one side of his face was, was facing the sun, and the other side wasn't. And that's kind of a dramatic difference between those two sides of the space. Do you agree? And once again, this is UVA damage over time. His skin wasn't getting red, but he was getting this full dose of UVA, which causes a lot of damage. This is um, this is. This was created on a computer, but we basically right and left mapped the two sides of the face as if he did get as much sun exposure or did. There's a big difference there between those. Okay, so enough of the deterioration skin. How do we fix this, right? Because I will tell you, we, we were sold this bad bill of goods when we were young. We said this idea of a healthy tan. Do you remember hearing about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we all have it. And so what can we do to reverse sun damage? Well, I mean, the first thing we can talk about is medications. There's a product out there called Tretinoin. I, I trained at the University of Pennsylvania. Albert Quigman was actually in the Department of Dermatology there. He actually discovered uh, Retin-A or Tretinoin. And this is an interesting medication. This actually gets in this basal cell layer. This is the epidermis again. It gets in this basal cell layer and it actually fixes some of the DNA damage. When the UVA and UVB rays actually hit our skin, it creates uh, something in the DNA, DNA called thymine dimers. And it's a binding together in the DNA of these thymine molecules, and that leads to irregular cells that lead to skin cancers. Well, Retin-A is actually able to break some of those, so that's actually helpful. Hydroquinones is another product that we can use that can help with uh, skin pigmentation. Medically, there are things such as chemical peels, there's laser or light skin care we'll talk about, and the thing that I do a lot of called lasers for certain skin cells. So I'll start with the easy things. So this is medical skin care. And so she's a tennis player, and she had a lot of pigmentation you know, on her jawline. And this is using medical products, such as retin and hydroquinones. And this is something you can just do at home. And this is you know, under the care of a doctor. And this is another example about the spots on the face and uh, 
And really, regardless of the ethnicity, I mean, she had darkness in her upper lip on the chin. We can we can actually reverse a lot of uh, sun damage using just these medical products. Uh, this young woman with these we call them like the sun-kissed cheeks, right, with the freckles. And I think it's a much healthier appearance here with her skin being healthier. Okay, so the second thing that I like doing is I do a lot of work with lasers. And I, I, it's funny, I learned things from my, from my patients. We are, we are students as well as physicians. We learn things through our career from, from our patients a lot of times. I'll, I'll talk about this. So I was using this for the longest time to help people with their skin. It made the skin look better to a certain degree. Like she had a lot of pigmentation issues and tightness, and her skin is much cleaner here. And, um, and then this woman had a problem with a lot of lines. I mean, we all, a lot of us have that issue with the lines around the lips, right? And we may, have, we may have never smoked, and you don't have to smoke to have lines around the lips, but you do have to be in the sun. You have to be in the sun. The sun is what really causes that. Um, smoking doesn't help the process, but you, you could have never smoked and still end up with lines around the lips. So she was troubled by that, and I'm able to make dramatic improvements in this with these procedures using laser This is a permanent result. Once she has this, she can hold on to this. Um, this is another example like this in terms of spots on the skin. And, um... Okay, so then, this is interesting. I, I took care of a woman a couple years ago, and I did surgery to, um, she had eyelids that were drooping, and so I did a surgery to raise the eyelids. At the same time, I worked on her, because she was kind of sleepy there, right? Mm -hmm. So I worked on her lower lids too, and then I used the laser down here to clean up the skin, and you can see the skin looks a little cleaner here. Okay? Uh, she came back to me two years later, and she's on something called Epidex. And Epidex is a medication that brings out sun damage. And she was erupting in lesions all over her face, um, except for, can you see it? Uh, in this area right here? This area right here, I'll show you here. It's a little more dramatic with both So lesions everywhere, but not here. Can you appreciate that? Yeah. And my hypothesis is that she had lesions there. That wasn't the area that escaped all the lesions. She had them there. When I did this, this, this procedure two years prior, we wiped away that sun damage. So this was actually the healthiest skin in her body at that point. I then, I then treated the rest of her face. And this actually turned me on to the fact that I can actually, as, as I said, patients become teachers. And I learned this now. So now I am able to help people reverse sun damage. So this one was actually sent to me by a dermatologist. She was tired of getting, I mean, some of us have had this, these things frozen off the face by the dermatologist. Um, and the nice thing is, well, that helps some of the lesions, but there's some underneath the skin we don't even know about that are gonna come out in six months. So this procedure can be very uh, comprehensive in that way and can really remove the lesions that we see and even the lesions that we don't see. Um, I can actually get underneath um, certain uh, early skin cancers too, uh, spring cell carcinomas and basal cell carcinomas. I can actually treat certain early ones too when I'm treating patients. And yes, does it help the appearance? It does also, but you know, it fundamentally makes her skin with all these, it makes her skin healthy, right? She looks like a better version of herself. This is another woman who came to see me. I know this is kind of shot. She's from Miami. And I was excited when I saw her because I, I, I see patients like I think, oh, wow, I can really help her. And uh, by changing uh, the skin in this area, I don't know if I have public pigmentation. I, and I think it does look like her granddaughter, right? Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> but it is her. And, and that's what I, I love doing this. I love helping people this way. The idea that I can make a person's skin healthier so they don't have to deal with cancers in the future, but then you look better too. I love this. Okay, so that is that does have a recovery associated with it. I have an international practice. People stay with me for about 10 days. They fly in. I have a whole infrastructure set up where people fly in and they stay with me for a time period and they go back to their homes. Um, but I like to take care of my patients when I'm there. But that has downtime. And sometimes people say, well, what, what do you have, doctor, that doesn't have downtime? I don't really have that kind of time to, to spend. And there are things. So this is interesting. This is something called raw base light. Um, this, uh, this is something that we could use in a, an office setting to help with pigmentation. We can help with brown spots, um, red spots you know, on the face. So this sort of cleaning of the skin, this was, I think, with uh, two treatments about, uh, about a month apart uh, with much cleaner skin. And that was where we thought it stopped. We thought, okay, well, it helps, helps people with their skin. I was doing this initially, I have a PA who does it, but initially I was treating people on the face and I was doing their, we called the chest the decolletage. And then the woman wanted to wear strapless, so I did her shoulders, and I did her arms, and then she came up and said, I'm not happy. I said, well, you're not happy about Well, I can, you know, I can my hands. And so, <laughs> so I treated her hands, and then she came back and said, I'm so unhappy. I said, what's the problem now? The fingers. So I went back and treated the fingers. So it's interesting. That's one thing with this that would work so well. You have to kind of decide where you get off the train, you know, because it, it, works, it works so great. 
So we thought this was great for um, for the appearance, but we thought it stopped there. But interestingly, in Stanford, they did research on this. And they did biopsies of the skin of people. And they found that um, in our cells, there's something called the messenger RNA. It's sort of the uh, protein, at least it leads to the protein synthesis in our cells. And people who had um, these treatments done, uh, compared with a younger subset who never had it done, or an older subset that never had it done, started to revert back to a younger state. And this is really interesting. So this is a gentleman, actually, who had this done over about 12 years. And his skin is looking better without a lot of downtime, even though he's you know, getting older. And uh, this is actually the slide. This is younger, untreated. This is messenger RNA. So we're seeing this is the older skin. So we got more of this yellow here, more of the blue here. So it's actually reverting back to the younger state. This doesn't have a lot of downtime. But we do this, this is an example for the decolletage for spots there. We use it for hand spots too. And this, this doesn't have, this is people can fly and fly out easy, and this, and this doesn't have recovery time. We do it for faces. Um, this doesn't show that well, but this is, there's pinkness here on the cheek that we can treat. This is a, a condition known as poikoidermal of survive. It's a vascular condition people have sometimes uh, due to sun exposure on the neck. Um, this is treating one half of the neck and not the other half of the neck. Um, we can use this actually to do hair removal too, even on people of color. Um, there are certain uh, uh, ethnicities have curly hair that they get stuck in the neck, something called pseudofolicolitis barbae. And a lot of times the laces actually will damage their pigmentation. I, this sort of BBL and the other ones I have can actually protect the pigmentation, which is really nice. And then we have lasers that can treat really bad um, things like rosacea. Rosacea is actually a chronic condition, unfortunately, it doesn't. It can be cured, but it can be managed, thankfully, uh, with these treatments. One, it takes about two or three treatments, and then maybe three times a year to maintain that. We do things where we tighten skin with these devices, too. Um, so that's, this is the BBL. We like this. Okay, another, another case study. This is actually a, um, a federal judge in my area, and he came to me because it was the same thing. He said, you know, doctor, I'm sitting up there on the bench, and, you know, attorneys are coming to me, and they're saying, you know, your Honor, do you want to take a recess? When I go back to your chambers, you look really tired. You know, and he, he doesn't want he doesn't want people thinking about him that he's looks tired. And I, I, I looked at him and I said, I think I, I know what's going on. I really do think this lower eyelid back is what's really that nonverbal communication it implies is one of not getting enough rest. So I thought, like, well, if I can help him with that, that would make a big impact. And so I did. And he's in his he's in his mid seventies. Right? And I think that he does look better. I think he looks maybe you know, in his 50s show. Well, this is a story of unintended consequences. So he was married for a long time, and his wife was in her 70s too. And this is his wife. And so they were out socially, and people were coming up to him, and they said, you know, they didn't know them. They said, yeah, can you introduce me to your mom? And I will tell you, a woman never wants to know anything but the beautiful partner of the person they're with, right? Anyway, so I, you know, she came to me and she said, you know, I. We can't have this. We can't have me looking over him. So I looked at her and I said, well, I probably need to do more for you, but I think I have ways to help you too. And so I looked at her skin and the and the, the lines and the wrinkles here, and I thought, well, if I could tighten that, that would make a big difference for her. And so this is her now. And now I, I think she looks better now too. I think they're kind of a nice, nice match couple now. Okay, three days of aging. The next thing let's talk about is uh, descent. So I do a lot of surgery for eyelids and eyebrows, and um, a lot of times it is an issue of something eyelid or eyebrow coming down, and then the lower leg bags, and there's a thing called lower eyelid festoons. This is what I have my, this is how I was pushing them internationally is for my treatment festoons, and I'll just talk a bit about that. The known as um, festoons of male amounts, they're this bag that forms on the cheekbone, and sometimes in the lower lid. Uh, they can form within the lid, or sometimes it's a small amount on the cheek. And it's been sort of a problematic, um, issue for a lot of surgeons to deal with for a long time. And I think I've found a way that really makes a big difference for this. And I've actually published this in a medical text uh, that's available uh, for other doctors. Um, and this is an example of treating these, uh, these festoons you know, that I do with laser. So this is the person I told you about before. She was um, you know, at Disney as an actress. And this was affecting her. And these are her examples of her festoons. And with this technique, I can really make a big difference. Not, now, not only if we were to go, once again, a couple years later, that might be the healthiest skin on her body at that point. Not only is it less better, it's actually fundamentally healthier. This woman is actually a hairdresser, and she had some really dramatic festoons on the cheek. So we'll talk about this is lower with bags, and this is really festoons that are male amounts of on the cheek. When I was on, uh, I was featured on the Dr. Oz show, um, she was the patient that I came on, and I demonstrated for him using lasers on, on everything else of an avocado. 
<laughs> but uh, actually, Alpha Cloud is a really good demonstration. You can find this online if you look it up online and go to Dr. Oz's site and Google my name, you'll find this episode. Uh, but I showed, I was showing him, you know, about how I wanted people to know that there's a way to treat these, this condition. It's great that he brought us on, on air for that. And this is an example of that sort of skin tightening that we can create with the, um, with the laser. Now there is recovery sister. This is another example of a, of a woman with upper and lower eye with having this. Um, I do treat a lot of men, actually. And she came to me because people in the big group were saying to her, you know, do you want to do you have to go take a rest or something? It looks like you're, you're falling asleep on us here. We want someone who's vibrant you know, in our group. And she felt vibrant, but there were things that were going on. And I will say with her eyes, you know, it's called the Betty Davis eyes, right? The, uh, the bedroom eyes, because that, that, that lower eyelid, but that does give a sort of appearance of being more sleepy. And so I, I, I love helping patients this way. Um, this guy was actually a teacher in my area, um, and he was getting comments from his middle school teacher. He was getting comments from the students asking about, uh, you know, they said, you know, were you drinking this weekend or something? Because sometimes fullness can imply being, uh, being sick or drunk. Okay. So I, sometimes it's not really eyelids, sometimes it's brows. And I do, uh, I do surgeries actually upper face lips in this area here where I can help with eyebrows that fall. And these are dramatic ones again, because this, this is a more male configuration. This is more of a, that, that Fibonacci ratio I was talking about. Um, so I work on her lower lids and her upper lids, and you know, it looks like her younger sister, I think, sometimes. These are other examples of this, uh, of, uh, of brows. This patient I showed you um, before, this was actually done not with surgery, but I use Botox a lot of times for facial rebalancing. I use it for migraines too. There are a lot of people who have problems with chronic headaches or retention headaches or migraines. And Botox, this we learn these things serendipitously. You know, we were treating patients uh, for years, and the and patients would come back to us. A lot of women would say, you know, doctor, I don't know what you did, but I had terrible migraines for years. And what did you do? Because I've not had a migraine for the last four months. You know, with the Botox working, and I've I have patients actually coming across the country now to treat for me to help them with this because it helps both the appearance and helps you know with headaches that can be very debilitating. So once again, this was actually done without, without surgery. There's ways I can use Botox actually to rebalance the face, and I think that's kind of nice. And then when she smiles, it doesn't crinkle as much in that area too. So the last thing I want to talk about here is deflation of the face. So when we age, um, we have sort of this wide, full face. We call it sort of the triangle of youth. Um, and it is around the eyes and mouth there that we're talking about. If we look at Rita Hayworth, over time, what happens is we lose spatial volume in a three-dimensional way. You know, the bones change, the fat pads change in the face, uh, skin changes. But with the, the loss of volume in the bones and in the, and in the fat pads, the, the face becomes more boxy. And this isn't fair, but the aging process tends to move both male and female faces more to a male configuration as we get older. So, and this is the, people sometimes say to me, they say, well, you know, it's gravity. Gravity's acting more on my face than it did before. And I don't, I really don't think that's true. And we have an example here of a tulip, and it's full of water, right? It stands up erect. If the water starts to leave the tulip, what happens? Right? It falls. And it's not that there's any more gravity acting on the tulip, it's that it's lost its volume. And our faces are kind of the same way. We, we lose volume sort of as we age, and a lot of things I do, uh, that doesn't require surgery, thankfully, is adding volume back in the correct places. This is another, this was a study done in Germany. They uh, took uh, this face and they artificially changed it each time to be more congruent with those golden ratios. And they, they actually um, asked 10,000 university students in Germany to judge these photos and ask them to pick the two photos they like the best. Why well, I'll ask you, what are the two photos that you, your brain tells you you like the best? Body sex, yeah, and that, I think most everyone says that. So. 100% of people choose five and six. And what I'm trying to show you here, this is your subconscious brain working. We like these things, and that's what I'm passionate about, because I know the way the brain processes the face. I like to create results for my patients that work on this subconscious level that are very powerful on one hand, but very subtle on the other. I don't want people pointing to my patients saying, this person has something done, but the fact that they look better, and it feels like they maybe changed their hair, or they got new earrings, or something like that, that's the way I like to work. So I actually was thinking about these three days of aging, and I was thinking, well, a lot of people don't have time to recover. So there a way that I could devise something that would allow me to address all three in an outpatient basis. And this is an example of, of this. It's something I call the radium lift. So this is the idea of volume. I mean, this happens. We have we have uh, we lose volume in the cheekbone here, and this seems to fall. Sometimes it looks like like a jowl sometimes. And that's not a great that's not great that we have this fit here. Well, it's possible actually without surgery to straighten the jawline. 
um, with this procedure where I can add volume in, in the right places. This is a patient of mine, this is interesting. She, um, there was a, it was actually on YouTube, there was a, um, a comedian who had this uh, video called the resting bitchy face. I don't know if you ever heard that. Mm. It's, it's pretty funny, you can, you can watch it. But this woman came to me and she said that she called this her older bitchy face. She said, because everyone came to her and thought she was mad. And I'll tell you, when I look at her, she's very sweet. But do you get that also? She looks upset there, do you agree? Yeah, and so I think it was this downturn of the mouth that created that. And by adding volume in this area, I was able to get this volume. I would rather kind of talk to her party than this person. I think the thing that we're nervous about, though, is that there are all these bad results out there. Right? Yeah. We, see, we see crazy cheeks that are too big for the face. We see, you know, this is more of a male configuration for a cheek than a female. Females should have more up here. Um, we have lips that look out of control. And, you know, that's really what we're nervous about because we look, I mean, I see it's on the streets of Miami. I go, I just speak in LA a lot, New York, and you see all these awkward results out there. And that's when they're not paying attention to these ratios. I mean, I think it's so critical. You have to have an eye for these ratios that belong on the face. So this is a, a patient of mine. And um, I will ask you about how many years older does she look in this second photo? About. Shout out. 10 years? Yeah. I, I, she looks older a little bit, right? You agree? Yeah. She looks a little older here. She looks a little younger. And this is, a, this is kind of a trick because she's, this is actually when I first started working with her. And this is her about three years later. So you know, by paying attention to these three Ds of the aging, I can get results that do look better. And I love doing this. I love helping people navigate the world. I want the world to work to relate better to my patients. That's what I'm passionate about. So here, this nonverbal communication. I want to help my patients so the world can relate better to them. I actually use this also for um, for, no, for nose jobs. Actually, I've done a lot of work with uh, these volume replacements to fix awkward um, noses. I, I have a lot of patients who've had bad nose jobs. Like this woman had a nose job about 20 years ago, it was kind of crooked. And I can use these same sort of volume replacements and put it in the exact right place, and the nose can look straighter. Right? Now this is, I call it a light line, I create a light line because it's all about light and shadow. I mean, if you paint, you know about the way the light plays on the face, and a lot of lights above us. Uh, sunlight, room lights, and light is constantly playing on our face. So if I can take advantage of that and think about creating the, the highlights and the shadows that I want in my patients, that's where I get results that look more natural that way. So the last part I want to talk about is this idea of panfacial uh, equation. This is actually, a, uh, this photo is from a picture by Rorick and Pessa. Um, they're in Dallas. They actually did uh, biopsies of uh, the fat compartments of the face, and really these are the fat compartments that exist there, and there are many different ones that we have, and they sort of, they, we sort of age and we lose them sort of asymmetrically. This is actually a woman who was, you know, you know, we see this, we see patients who get volume replacement, and she was, loved the fact that she had cheeks, and she kept saying, I want bigger cheeks, bigger cheeks. Well, my issue with this is these do look young, the lips look young, but the, the hobble she has here, it doesn't look congruent to me. And I don't, I think this looks a little bit awkward. And for me, I was thinking more, if we could make that congruent, that would be better. This is an example of some of these things where I can add it back volume to both, let's say, the temple on the cheek, and I can give more of a, more of a sweetheart curve back to the face. This is another example like this. And these are, these are nice because these don't require surgery. These are all office treatments. I do this for, for men too. I mean, he, uh, he had lost a lot of volume in his cheeks and it gave him more of a gaunch look, um, more kind of sick, and getting him back that structure really helped him. So this was another patient of mine who taught me a little something. She's actually, she's in her 50s, she's a physician, and you know, she's the one who said to me, you know, doctor, I remember when I was younger, I didn't really have this shadow here. And I looked at it and I said, you know, that kind of goes with this paper I was just looking at. So you can almost see this could be the fat pad that she's missing here. Can you see that? And can you imagine, look at the photo, if you, can you imagine, if you put that shape on there, what that would look like? Right? She's in her 50s, and I'll say, as an Asian, Asian patients do age well, I think this looks great, because the brain likes to see uninterrupted curves, and bring back that curve, we brought her back. I think she does look like in her 30s there, and I love helping people out. Anyway, I want to thank you all for your attention, and I have a book available on Amazon. If you're a Amazon Prime member, it's actually free. If, uh, if not, I think it's about $2.99 or so, but if you're interested, you can, you can read that. And I have a lot of stuff, a lot of resources on my web. I have a TV channel, you can learn about those things. And I will open this up. If you have questions, I would love to, um, to answer any questions you might have. Yes? Can you elaborate a little bit on EDL? 
Yeah, BPL is the use of broad-based light. And what happens is there's this, it's a little technical, there's a, a theory known as selective photothermolysis. It's the idea that we can selectively put photons of light to a specific part of, of tissue and leave the rest of the tissue protected. So like going after those vessels, we're going after spots. The spots are deeper in the skin, but we don't want to burn the skin. So the light, we can actually have, uh, it's a light treatment with a light flash where we put a filter and that targets specifically those, um, those spots, if you will. We can target both brown initially and then red separately or both together. So is it a laser? It's, it's not actually laser. It's actually, it's actually a form of, of pulsed light. Uh, BBL, broad-based light, is really an upgrade of what they used to call IPL, or intense pulse light, because BBL, if the, it's something known as the fluence, the amount of energy that's able to be delivered is so much higher, they can get much deeper in the skin and get much better results. And that, the funny thing about that I was saying is that we didn't realize that that was actually helping create healthier skin. But now from Stanford, we have research showing that you know, I think that the way that, you know, we, we go to the dentist twice a year, right? We keep our teeth clean, because that's good for health. To a certain degree, <clears throat> actually doing this treatment maybe three times a year could be healthy for our skin for a long time, too. Yeah, other, other questions? Yes, sure. Yes? Uh, with the laser procedures, how long do they require before they actually get the results? She was asking, with the laser procedure, how long do the results last for? I will tell you that decades, um, you know, if a person protects their skin from the sun, the body reverse the sun damage, and that's the youngest skin on their body. And the body has amazing regenerative abilities. It's incredible about this. We learn this now. This whole idea of regenerative medicine is exploding in medicine right now. And that's, that's part of what we're doing. The idea is to wound the skin to a certain level and then have the body heal it. So once it's fixed, if they are if they are good about, I'll let them go to the beach. I don't have a problem with that. They can be on tests. They can be on boats. No problem with that. They have to wear their sun protection. You know that glasses. If you're out, you know, if someone's out playing golf, I would say they put their sun protection on before they go. And if they're out for three or four hours, yeah, you stop for a minute and around and you reapply. And if you do that, you make that a habit. Yeah, these results last last your life. She's asking if there's any maintenance required with fillers. Yeah, there are yeah, certain ones, it depends on the body, but I often, the way I try and do procedures is I try and get the body to create its own natural collagen. And so, yes, there we do do uh, volume replacement certain products. One that I like is one called Sculpture that, um, that I can use on the whole face. And what's nice about it is it's a person's own collagen that builds there. That actually has a lifespan of about two to, two to five years once it's set up, but that is something you have to be patient with. It takes a couple of treatments to get there. Other questions? Yes, in front. Is it at all possible for you to do these, use these techniques here in San Miguel or, or not? Well, I don't have a license here in San Miguel yet. <laughs> I mean, maybe I could consider that and come out here and do this, but I mean, we have a great setup We're right near the airport. And we're very close. I mean, I have, I have a thriving international practice already where I am in my, in my area. But, uh, so it's very easy to come into to my area for treatments too. But uh, yeah, it's not another question. I can think about that someday. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Right, you were asking, so the question was about, and there, you may have heard things called fraxel or fractionated lasers. Um, so, you know, fractionated lasers are interesting. <clears throat> so, the funny thing about this is that I trained with a guy, his name is Sterling Baker, who was a pioneer in the use of lasers um, for facial studies. And I often say we do stand on the, the shoulders of giants. I mean, in my, the person I trained with really was a giant in this field. And I love the fact that I can teach other people too now, is that we help each other in, the, in medicine. Anyway, um, I had a great training in lasers. Um, so I like using lasers to take off all of the layers of the skin because there are hidden sun damage lesions that we don't even see that are there, there. And I like to take those off because then the skin can come back healthier. Now the problem with that is that there is a wound that has to be managed. <clears throat> and if someone is not comfortable managing those wounds, they don't want to get involved with that procedure. Um, and so that's where things such as Fraxel came out because it was a way that the industry responded to people who wanted to do something but didn't really have the comfort level of taking care of patients with these more aggressive wounds. So Fraxel, what they do is they have these little, uh, so let's say my laser goes all the way down, takes away all the skin. It takes away like a little pit of skin, okay? 
And what it does then is those areas actually heal together a little bit tighter. So it can help with a little bit of skin tightening. But unfortunately, it doesn't really get all of the sun lesions away. So I, I had it. You know, it's good sometimes for scars, actually. That sort of fractionated thing is actually pretty good for scars. But I prefer this, I, I call it a fully ablative laser uh, better. Yes? So if we wanted to consider having this done, are you doing consultations while you're here? When I am here, I would be happy to meet with you guys, sure. And, and yeah. so the procedure would be, we consult with you? If, if you were here, and then make an appointment to fly into Tampa, you said? Yeah, and what I do, because I have this international practice, I have a whole setup on my website um, where, because a lot of people don't have that opportunity to be, be in their town necessarily to consult with. I'm happy to talk with you guys down here. But um, what we do is we actually have um, uh, sort of medical records. We have a HIPAA compliant encrypted website where people upload their information and their questions and their photos, and then we converse back and forth. I kind of look at the photos. I say, well, these are the things that I suggest, and then the people kind of fly in, you know, um, for surgery. Because um, your website tells us how much it's going to sell us back. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, once you yeah, you know, once you send the photos, then my staff will communicate with you what the investment. Yes. <laughs> Correct. These are more. The, yeah, I would love it if they. I mean, the Sun Out. I would love it would, if it would, but they have. But they don't want to do that. They would rather have you freeze off every individual one. I think it's better if we get rid of all of them. Just start the skin over. And, you know, because it, I, I lived on a lake. I was in the sun when I was growing up too. And and the idea that we have these lesions that are coming out as we get older. That's not a fun thing. And some of these are dangerous lesions that we have. And the fact that we can make the skin healthier. I really love this. Other questions? Yes. Can you tell us about the 10-day <coughs> fly-in program? Yeah, so I usually, I usually have people come in, the, they might be 11 days, 11 or 12 days, actually. Because you have to come in the day before where, where I do sort of an assessment. Because I do my best assessment based on, on the photos and the information you know, over the internet and we talk with people. But sometimes when people come in as well. So but the question is, I think, you start out, and then for those 10 days, what are we doing? So in the 10-day period, so okay, if I use lasers on a person's face, I actually take down the skin level, the, there's raw skin there. And I have a whole protocol set up that help people um, heal that skin. So it's actually keeping it moist, it's cleaning it with certain solutions that I recommend. And usually by about 10 days, uh, that's a good time where people can, can go back home. We would have to stay at a hotel right near your office. Correct, and we have hotels that have, it's amazing how the community kind of comes up to support you. So I've, <laughs> I have these two hotels that people stay at that, uh, that are great because they actually provide transportation uh, for patients to and from the airport and to every office visit that they have to come to. Uh, they provide breakfast uh, every day and they provide dinner four nights a week. Um, that we, have, we have two hotels like that that love to do that. And then we have, yeah, we have private homes. I have people who bring entourages, and we have private homes that people will rent if they want to have a lot of people come. And uh, you know, I have certain people that, that they don't want the paparazzi knowing what's going on with them. And so we have places that sort of are secluded that I can help people like that as well. Other questions? Yes. Are you teaching other doctors how to do this? Yeah, I teach all the time. I mean, I was just uh, I was just in Vegas at a cosmetic surgery forum. I think that the issue is that. <laughs> These conditions, festoons, interestingly, um, a lot of doctors don't really want to deal with it, <clears throat> is my estimation, because I do teach this. I have videos on YouTube showing how this is done. And I've not had a lot of people actually and you know pick it up and take take it on. I think they find it interesting. I call this <clears throat> I call this procedure the uh, stepchild of the cosmetic surgery industry because I don't think a lot of people like to deal with it. Um, they would rather deal with tummy tucks and breast augmentations. Mm. Basis, but these things, if you look online, best students, it's very, doctors often say there's no treatment for this. And that's what I love helping people with. Any doctors in Miami? In Miami? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do know. I mean, there are doctors in Miami, there are tons of doctors in Miami. I know none that have my skill set now. Okay. Other questions? Yes. There's a product out that was just approved by the FDA about a month ago called Voluna. Voluma. Is that? Well, there was one that, actually, there's one that was just approved about, that one has been a couple months. There's one that's called Kybella that was just approved, actually. And Kybella is one that you can use to melt fat under the skin without surgery. So certain people have problems with a double chin. And it's actually used, this is kind of neat because you can inject that into the skin and it actually breaks down the fat. And that's actually a permanent result. I, 
actually I'm one of the 200 physicians in the country now that's able to offer this, so I offer this now too. Voluma is a type of filler that lasts about two years. They, they, there's this thing called hyaluronic acids. Um, we have this in our body, we have hyaluronic acids. We're actually, I used to do, when I was in medical school and residency, I did uh, research on, um, uh, on actually fetal animals that we had, uh, I think sheep, and we were looking at wound healing back then. It's kind of interesting because we would go and make a wound, you know, in the face in, in, a, in a fetal sheep, and then they would deliver, and we'd see what the wound looks like when they develop. And interesting, if you were early enough in the process, there was healed with no scar. And it had something to do with the hyaluronic acid levels, because when we're in utero, we have tremendous levels of hyaluronic acid, you know, around us. So anyway, these, these compounds like uh, the hyaluronic acids, like Voluma, Restylane, Juvederm, Velotero, um, Restylane Silk, you know, now actually this one, Restylane Silk, for those lines, those vertical lip lines that people have, um, I have lasers that can permanently get rid of it, I think that's gonna have recovery, or, I have now a product that's meant for the superficial skin, and that can be an office treatment where people can come in, have it done, go back, and that, that's been very nicely. I've been using that a lot for a lot of patients. Yes? We have, we're, Kate, we're able to buy um, uh, Retin-A here on yes. the counter. Should we, I just use it around my eyes. Is it something we should be using all over our yeah, faces? Yeah, you can use it on your whole face. Now, Retin-A, when you first started, your skin's a little rougher at first. Okay. It's, it's usually worse before it's better because it really does push out a lot of the old damage. Yeah. But yes, retin A. We should use it all over Yeah, we use it all over Yes, it would. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned um, hydroquinone. Yes. And there's been, I, I've read some articles that it's controversial. Right. Depending and, on, can you talk about that? Yeah, there's on, oncocerosis, which is this, when you use very high levels, you know, in a lot of uh, parts of places like India and such, they found this. When you use very, very high levels, high concentrations of these hydroquinones, it can cause a problem with people with a lot of uh, dark skin color. They can have sort of a, a whitening of the skin to a certain degree, or, or, or thickening of the skin. Color. I will tell you, if you look at American <coughs> dermatology departments, they are totally against that. This we have been using this for decades, very safely for patients. So. Really, it's a very safe medication to use if it's being used properly. Other questions? Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for coming to listen to my talk, and I will be outside in the uh, area there, the uh, cafe area, if you want to come and talk with me, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you.